countdown to a Bali high wedding has begun. At the royal palace of Ubud, villagers from far and wide are carrying out their centuries-old Balinese wedding traditions. We had about six pigs donated so far, but we need two and a half tons of pigs. At the centre of it all is the mother of the royal groom, <laughs> an Australian Balinese princess. I was trying to work out how much one pig weighs to see how many more pigs we need. <laughs> Organising a wedding is stressful for any mother. It's pouring with rain. Hmm, yeah, that could be a problem. <laughs> what if you are also expected to supervise complex Hindu traditions, observe royal protocols, and your son, the prince, is marrying a celebrity Indonesian actress? With only a week to go before the big day, hundreds of villagers arrive daily with their donations of ritual offerings and food, tributes to their revered royal family. <laughs> it's also a chance to get close to the celebrity bride, Happy Salma, adored Indonesian TV star. Nervous for my wedding. <laughs> Excited too, and yeah. It's a whole new world for Happy, a Muslim from Java. But for Prince Jok Gus, a Hindu, their marriage ceremony is a familiar part of his people's spiritual life. Balinese wedding is different to anywhere in the world. It's, it's kind of a mix between animistic and uh, Buddhist and Hindu beliefs. So. It's something that's unique to, to Bali, so I think, of, of course, being Balinese, it's, it's important, yeah. I don't think she's ever seen a Balinese wedding, so... <laughs> I don't think you can ever be prepared for what's happening. <laughs> it's probably better not to be. <laughs> The head of this extended royal family of about 300 members is Princess Azri's husband, the groom's father. My name is Jokorda Raka Kertiasa. I come from the uh, warrior family. We can trace up to 24 generations back. Until the early 1900s and Dutch colonial rule, the royal family were the feudal monarchs of Ubud. Ubud lies in the interior of Bali. At the heart of Ubud is Puri Ubud, the royal palace. It's the cultural center of Bali, renowned for its spirituality. Balinese Hinduism, mixed with an ancient reverence for the natural world, is part of the fabric of daily life. And the villagers look to the palace as custodians of their faith. Back in 2004, the royal family presided over the biggest funeral ceremony in living memory. The cremation of the daughter of the last true king of Bali. A woman regarded for most of the last century as a living goddess. In 2004, Princess Azri's daughter, Princess Maya, was an 11-year-old schoolgirl boarding in Sydney for most of the year. 
she came to Bali to honour her grandmother and fulfil the role she was born to, a Balinese princess. Ubud's royal ceremonies bring together thousands of local people, a community of over 69 villages. And now, seven years later, the community is once again preparing for another royal event in Ubud. This time, the wedding of a prince. And today, Princess Azri and her husband, Prince Chikorda Raka, are hosting a party for their royal family. And everyone is invited. Just having a sort of pre-wedding get together with the family. Right now everyone's busy eating. Everything in Bali involves eating. <laughs> As Princess Astri entertains her royal in-laws, it's a world away from the reception she received as a young bride-to-be 32 years ago. My name before I got married was Jane Gillespie. So, yeah, plain Jane. It was 1977, and the 23-year-old kindergarten teacher from Sydney, holidaying in Ubud, fell for the local children's theatre director, a prince. That's a long-time love story. <laughs> it's a destiny, yeah, in English, destiny, yeah. Jane's parents hadn't expected a holiday romance would lead to her marrying the Balinese prince. My father was fine about it. Actually, I remember him saying, well, you know, thank God he's not Australian. <laughs> he wasn't a great Australian fan, my father. Lieutenant Colonel Rollo Gillespie, an ex-British intelligence agent, had made a life in Australia with his wife and two children. My father had been married before. He was quite a lot older than my mother, but not as old as Raka's father was. <laughs> Raka grew up with ten mothers and numerous siblings and things. Of course, I only grew up with one mother and one brother. <laughs> as the youngest son of his father's tenth wife, the prince was expected to marry within the Balinese royal family. There was quite a lot of opposition to it and people trying to talk him out of it. And they took my passport away and had me checked out in Interpol. Prince Chikorda Raka refused to bow to family pressure and in 1978 made an Australian commoner a Balinese princess. For newlywed Princess Azri, palace life was far from palatial. We didn't have electricity, we didn't have running water, refrigeration, telephones. Yeah, we didn't have much at all, really, in those days. You know, Albert was a very tiny village. I think my parents were a bit shocked. <laughs> it was rather primitive, I guess, for them when they saw you know, the conditions that we would be living in, sort of stepping back in time almost. With the arrival of their first child, life in the palace became even harder for Asri. He was made with a degree in child psychology and child rearing, being told, you know, you can't do this and you can't do that. And, you know, I had my mother-in-law sleeping outside the door, knocking on the door every time there was a whimper. Or, you know, it was, it was quite difficult. I remember having to lock myself in my room sometimes. The biggest challenges were our own cultural differences and expectations, I guess. 
he had a lot of apologising to do to his family, I suppose, for, for me. You know, I had to also learn to bite my tongue and be, you know, give in to things when I felt it was necessary. But it was a steep learning curve for both of us to understand each other's cultures. And for a Balinese princess, observing sacred rituals was part of the role. I went to an Anglican school. I wasn't religious at all, but um, so changing to Hinduism wasn't a big deal for me. It's part of daily life here. It's not something that you consciously have to do or don't do. I mean, everybody does it. In your heart, you can pray to whoever you want. You speak through your actions and, and through your heart. Thirty-two years on, and Asri's seen Ubud's tourism and prosperity transform the once rural community. Increased wealth means Balinese royal weddings are observed far more lavishly. Look at, look at us. <laughs> For Chok Gus and Happy, Asri's wedding portrait is a picture of days long gone. More simple. Yeah, simple. But, yeah, but much smaller. Yeah, but I like this one. <laughs> All over Bali, it's not just in our family. People are much more affluent and they spend their money on ceremonies, so it's more of a big show now than, than it was in those days. Oh, well, that's it. <laughs> the head of the royal family, Prince Chakotaraka, is keeping an eye on the Royal Invitation Committee. Some of them preparing for the invitation to be sent tomorrow. But in Bali, not all invitations come printed on paper. The groom's father and older brother, Prince Jock Day, are supervising the preparation of invitations made of food. These are like a cultural invitation. This is the traditional way that you send out an invitation to uh, family and to other people within, you know, your, your sort of cultural circle. While the women are busy making elaborate decorative offerings for the wedding, it's traditionally the men who prepare these customary food invitations. There are strict conventions to observe with the pork satays. They have to count also the stick of the satay. For high priest, it should be uh, 22 stick. For the more important person, then become 16 stick. Then becomes recognized how important the person is sending the food. They'll go out in pickup trucks all over the place and they'll deliver them personally. As the traditional invitations are delivered to hundreds of royals, high priests and village elders in Ubud, down south on Bali's surf coast, the groom is personally delivering wedding invites to his mates. No more ticks for you, matey. <laughs> now you're set for life. <laughs> Only looky looky. <laughs> My full name is Chokorda Bagus Dwi Santana Kartiasa. Also, I'm called Max by a lot of Western people because that's what I was called when I was a kid in Sydney. If I grew up just like a normal kid in Sydney, we used to come back every year. Always kind of had a little taste of Balinese culture. When Asri and Chikoda Raka decided to educate their three children in Australia, it meant leaving Bali and living as Aussies. I was born in Bali and when you're born here, they bury your placenta. And there's a saying that um, Balinese are a type of people who find it very hard to uh, move abroad. It's because your, your placenta is buried here rather than cast away. We moved back and forth a lot though. I still get a bit confused sometimes, but 
they're just such different cultures. They're, they're like at, at polar ends, even though they're seemingly close. For his sister, Princess Maya, these cultural differences were unforgiving. Yeah, growing up was really difficult. Like, the main conflict for me is being a young girl. There's just such a difference between what's acceptable for a young woman to do uh, within the Western culture and within the Indonesian culture. There's also a little bit of prejudice because you're half Asian and so it's kind of difficult to deal with. You never know exactly where you fit in and exactly where you're accepted. Challenging years for Azri's husband, who took on work unheard of for a prince. Can you imagine a aunt doing a gardening on the street, you know, in Australia? And that's really big fight. When you grow up mentally, it's painful. And you have to face it until you pass it. And that kind of exercise, you really need it. You have to feel the pain. But after that pass, next time it's no problem. If I do gardening, I'm fine. If not, I'm also fine. With the royal family now permanently back in Bali for over a decade, Prince Jakarta Raka has become the head of culture and religion in Ubud, with the title of the wise one. And nowadays, they often also have to consult with me because I've been living in the West. That gives me some new perspective here yeah, in the modern time without losing the essence of our, our culture. Growing up in the West didn't sever cultural ties for the royal children. I've always had a strong connection just because of things my father always taught me. You know, Bali's your home and your ancestors and everything. As a teenager, Max left Sydney to live permanently in Bali as Prince Jock Gus. Especially here in Ubud, there's not, not much to do for young people. So uh, ceremonies are like going to the mall or something. You can go out there, you can look at the girls, you can meet up with your friends, you know. It's, like, it's, more, it's more like a social thing for young people. Max has always been a Bali boy. <laughs> this is his life here. He's lived in Australia, but he, he prefers it here. He likes to surf, you know, he's got all his friends, his gang. And like his father before him, Max met his bride on her holiday in Bali. Happy, uh, oh, we met when she was here on holiday with one of her friends, and then, then we all went to the beach. That's how we first met. After that, things got a bit more serious, yeah. Manicure. Ah. Happy comes from Java, an Indonesian island with very different cultural and religious traditions. Like Azri before her, Happy has a lot to learn to become part of this Balinese royal family. Wedding in Indonesia, not only married with the man, like me and with Chakus, but I'm married with the all family, like Chokus married with me, he married to my family too. Look, she's so beautiful. Always beautiful. <laughs> and for Happy Salma, the TV star, there's another family, her millions of devoted Indonesian fans. I don't really watch Indonesian TV, you know, so to me it's not such a big deal, I guess. Some of my cousin and uh, other family, people questioning about, oh, you will be here for actress, and look, I don't know what they expect. I never think of her as a celebrity. She's just, well, now my daughter-in-law. Just call her to 
I remember in my high school. <laughs> Supervised by Princess Wiwid, her sister-in-law to be, Happy is on a crash cultural course, learning how to make Hindu offerings for her royal wedding. Bali is still different, and they really have strong personality, and they really have a strong energy. So I still learn. First time. I'm so lucky I have her. <laughs> yeah. What was your wedding like? It's pretty much like this. Pretty full on for me. <laughs> A member of an aristocratic family herself, Wiwid had her own struggles when she fell in love with Prince Chok Day. I'm from a Catholic family. When I moved to Bali and then hang out with him, you know, got a Balinese boyfriend and he's Hindu and my family kind of thought, oh, you know, he's Hindu. I used to work in chiropractor clinic in Kuta. He was one of the patients. <laughs> Chiropractor, they fixed their back. He got a broken heart, so I had to fix it. After overcoming her family's initial reservations, Wiwid and Chok Day became another love match for his royal family. We're rebels. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably something that we learnt from our father. The traditional accepted thing to do is to marry within the same class, uh, someone from the same regional palace or the neighbouring palaces. <laughs> There's still a lot of alliance forming. And even today, a lot of the young generation are still doing that. 83-year-old <laughs> royal matriarch, Chok Day's grandmother, married a prince who already had nine other wives. <laughs> Asri's mother-in-law was the tenth wife of a much older husband. I was uh, the youngest in my family. My father, I heard from my oldest half-sister, he, he had about ten wives. Polygamy is part of traditional Balinese royal life. Well, a lot of people had said to him, oh, well, you know, that's OK, you can have her, but, you know, get a real wife too, a <laughs> Balinese wife. I just made it obvious to him that if he wanted to have another wife, that was fine, but he couldn't have two. I'm not going to be number one wife and, the, and have number two wife. I'll be the ex-wife. <laughs> My brother-in-law had two wives, and that doesn't work. I mean, it never works, no matter what they say. And even Balinese women don't like sharing. <laughs> I never talk about it. I never also think about it. For royal husbands, taking another wife is very much a personal decision. Yeah, obviously, I don't want that happen. Again, it's just up to Chuck Day. Like, you decided if you think you need another one. No, I think, yeah, we all know that we just want to be the only one. But then, yeah, yeah. Princess Azri has made a last minute dash to pick up formal Balinese outfits being made for the royal women in the bridal party. Asri's youngest child, 18-year-old Princess Maya, is with her for a last-minute fitting. Yeah, I think Maya's in a difficult position because, you know, there, obviously there's a lot of expectations on her, a lot of pressure on her, not from us, but from outside for her to marry a Balinese. Not only Balinese, but, you know, someone from the family. But, you know, when she looks around, the, the pickings are slim. <laughs> <laughs> if I marry outside of the royal family, I basically lose my title and I'm not a part of the family anymore. She does get a lot of pressure from other people. 
everybody trying to match her up with their son. Or it, sometimes it puts her off going to things because she just gets really tired of the pressure. Unlike her two brothers, Princess Maya needs to marry another royal family member to retain her title as a royal princess and to qualify for a Balinese royal wedding. In order to have a wedding like that, I'd be required to marry in the family and honestly, I don't really see that happening. So I don't think that's the type of wedding I'll be having. <laughs> With her son preparing for his wedding, Princess Azri needs to check on their business, an hour's drive away from Obud. At the moment, with the, the preparations for the wedding, it's a bit of a challenge because it's very busy here. Together with her son, Prince Chokkus, Princess Azri opened up a tea house. I wanted to have a business. Mum was also not doing much at the time, so we decided we'd do it together. I sort of thought of the things that I wanted to see in Bali that, I, that weren't here, and that's when um, my son and I came up with the concept of Biku. It's in an old wooden joglo, which is a Javanese house. It's kind of an eclectic mix of old Indonesia and uh, old England, I'd kind of say, yeah. When Asri's daughter-in-law wanted to work part-time, Nasri's just like, oh, well, why don't you work at Biku? So now become involved with the customer, with all the staff, the kitchen and everything. And then also I love making the cupcake. With a royal family in charge, tourists are not just after the cakes at Biku. Oh, which one is the uh, the princess? And then I'm like, that's the princess. <laughs> well, then you would you like to meet the princess? I'm like, oh yeah, if that's okay. <laughs> and for Princess Azri, their tea house also represents the changes she's experienced as a Westerner in Bali. Bali is a completely different place to the place I came to. I mean, there's nothing you can't do in Bali now. It's a luxury destination. It's decadent almost in, in so many ways. While the tourists enjoy themselves, the Balinese people put their traditional responsibilities first. Hundreds of Ubud's villagers are working hard on royal wedding preparations. Like their many offerings to the Balinese Hindu gods, this work is a sign of respect and appreciation. Most of this uh, donation and the workers is also all volunteer. So that's, that's how our tradition to keep the culture alive. As their gift to the royal family, an entire village is creating intricate ritual offerings to be displayed on the wedding day. The offering making will take days. Time the people of the village would normally spend working in their rice fields or in paid jobs. A replica temple is being made from pork fat and satays, complete with umbrellas made from innards. <laughs> Making these offerings for the royal wedding is an age-old spiritual custom. Spirituality is an integral part of life here. It's just a part of daily life. Bali moves to a different set of priorities than Sydney and more commercial parts of the world. 
at the end of the day, that's why people like coming here. Some people who even don't go to ceremonies say that there's something in the air here. The villagers have sculpted a macrocosmos, knowing that the gods and the ancestors will also appreciate the beauty of their art. With the offerings now complete, they're needed at the palace. It's a rough journey right across Ubud, along dirt tracks and bumpy roads. The offerings arrive at the palace in bits and pieces. The royal groom, Prince Chokkus, is on hand to receive the village's wedding gift. They just bring in this, um, so like a decorative offering. They've been making that for a few days, and uh, this is made from um, pig's fat and uh, satay, meat, made from pig's meat, yeah, mixed with coconut. <laughs> With 2,000 guests expected, Prince Chakordaraka and Princess Azri are making a personal visit to the wedding caterers. He just suggests us to have a taste. In she said this is the most popular vegetable, the fern and the stuff, fruit leaf. Mince kind of enwrapped by banana leaf and they steam it. Yeah, you have to try it. Yeah. Huh? Princess Azri is no stranger to organising large events under pressure. When the terrorist bombing struck Bali in 2002, Killing and injuring hundreds of tourists and locals, Azri threw herself into helping with the aftermath. At the crisis time, you know, helping in the hospital and then fundraising and, and helping in whatever ways we could after the bomb. It was hard sometimes to be an Australian. Australians seem to take it on as their tragedy, whereas actually it was a Balinese tragedy. People forgot the Indonesians that died in it. It affected a lot more Indonesians than it did Australians. You know, they were left with nothing. So I had tried to help the widows of the, the Indonesians that were killed there and on an ongoing thing. It wasn't just, you know, once. I mean, I, you know, try and help wherever I can, but not as part of the royal family, just as me. <laughs> the royal wedding is imminent, and the palace is desperate for the forces of nature to come to the party. It's now two days before the wedding. <laughs> two more sleeps. <laughs> Pouring with rain. Hmm, yeah, that could be a problem. We'll have rain stoppers on the day, so hopefully that'll work. The rain stoppers are Balinese mystics. The groom's older brother has this mystic already at work. This man is the rain stopper. He's just here seeing how things are going and looking after, I guess, the the unseen world. So, I mean, yeah, the rain is one thing. There's all sorts of other things that he can see that we can't see, yeah. The no, sun just stop. came out. <laughs> sun's coming out. Happy and nervous. <laughs> but excited. Can't wait. Can't wait till it's over. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
The wedding day dawns at Puri Ubud. In only a few hours' time, 2,000 guests will arrive. They'll witness ancient marriage rituals, unique to Bali. And the pressure is on for Happy, who's never even seen the ceremonies before. <laughs> It's the, the big day today, yeah. A bit nervous, yeah. <laughs> Didn't sleep so well last yeah. night, so yeah. <laughs> and how's Happy? Yeah, she's pretty nervous too, I think. She seems a bit stressed out at the moment, yeah. Happy's feeling more than wedding day nerves. Her Muslim background hasn't prepared her for the Balinese rituals. <laughs> that Princess Asri also found foreign. I was from an Anglican background. My other daughter-in-law is Catholic. We've all adapted and she'll adapt to Balinese beliefs and customs. Because I know what it's like then, you know, I want to be there for her. Prince Jakotaraka, as head of the royal family, arrives for a last-minute inspection. In another part of the palace, Princess Azri is under the ministrations of the bridal salon. I think I'm placed in the family now. I, mean, I think I'm fully embedded in there and yeah, some people accepted me, some people didn't, some people never did. This wedding day is going to be an epic for everyone in the royal family. There'll be two completely different wedding ceremonies. And the first one's about to start. Chokbus is getting dressed for his ceremony, which is the first part of the wedding ceremony. Yeah. So in the morning you have what's called the basic wedding. So anyone can have this basic wedding in the morning and they can be married. With a whole royal family in attendance, the morning ceremony begins. As a village priest officiates, happy and chokgus enact the ancient fertility rites and age-old customary roles for men and women. With the morning ceremony, it can be quite amusing. <laughs> you walk around and there's a the little whip that he whips you with. You have to walk around three times and you have to... You know, it's all symbolic cooking and... You have to sell things and he buys things. You have to sit on a coconut. It's quite involved, but um, some people just push you and poke you and sit you down and stand you up. And, you, know, you don't really have to think about it, you just do it. <laughs> According to Balinese tradition, the couple are now married. But this is no ordinary wedding, and grander royal rituals are about to take place. But holding a press conference in the middle of the wedding day isn't a part of royal tradition. <laughs> When the groom is a prince and the bride a star, the media won't be denied. Prince Chokus has found the right girl for him. I went out with a few Aussie girls. I always felt a bit too much difference. People are just um, wholly Western, I think. I didn't find that much of a connection. Like his older brother, Chokkus has also married an Indonesian bride. They've always steered towards Asian, usually Indonesian women. Maybe that they've seen how difficult it was for me <laughs> and they wouldn't want to put anyone through that. 
pengennya juga jangan sampai ada saya di sini. Maybe we saw how hard it was for mum to adapt here because it was well, it was a, a huge change. She had to learn two new languages and and learn how to speak to different people and seeing her come through it the way she did was something that gave us the inspiration. We've both married people who aren't Balinese as well, so they have to adapt and they have to change a lot to life here. But I guess it's a little bit easier for them. <laughs> we have a word called jodoh um, in Indonesia, which just means the one who you're meant to be with. guest list of VIPs is arriving to witness the high wedding. Old friends and um, Australian consul, my hairdresser. Hi. <laughs> the bride and groom are now being clothed in the full regalia of the Royal House of Ubud. about the lipstick, I'm gonna, when no one's looking, I'm gonna try and rub it off. <laughs> Besides that, it's all right. It's not too bad. Yeah, I think I can handle it for a few hours. Yeah. I think it's worse for the girls. The bride's crown is layers and layers of gold flowers, weighing kilos when finished. It's so heavy. It's so heavy and... I can't see the mirror. <laughs> like his bride's regalia, the groom will wear the traditional high outfit only seen in the Palace of Ubud. A prince of the warrior caste, he'll wear a royal kris. This is a symbolic dagger. So they're considered a sacred heirloom. They play a very important part in the life of the, the palace. So each palace will have almost like an armory of different krises being handed down by different generations. There's a very mystical, very magical uh, element to the kris story. So you'll ask where they came from and don't be surprised if someone tells you that it flew in a window or popped out of the ground. So these types of things happen at certain times in Bali. If a royal marries a royal, you get carried on the shoulders of your helpers, two big, big strong guys from the village. But if you marry someone who's not from the royal family, you have to walk. So we've all walked. <laughs> With her family watching on, Happy's becoming a Balinese princess. And like her Australian mother-in-law, she's taking on the role of a lifetime. This is my destiny as well. The high caste Brahmin priest bestows blessings and holy water on the couple. In this rite of passage, Prince Chok Gus is formally accepting his cultural obligations. I still got a lot to learn, but most people, they start to learn more after they get married and they have to be more involved with the community. It's just a process that keeps going on, you know. As the royal couple embark on their life together in Bali, Princess Asri knows what they'll face. 
happy will find it challenging to be part of Balinese culture. You know, it's quite demanding for anyone who hasn't been born in, and bred with it. And for him, I guess that he'll be negotiating throughout the whole thing, which is also difficult. Prince Chikotaraka has continued a royal dynasty with his Australian princess. We're all quite good at swapping between cultures. I like to encourage the keeping of Balinese culture. Today, their children have chosen to embrace their royal Balinese heritage and live in the modern world. The most important in Bali is the concept of balancing. Balance doesn't mean stagnancy. Balance is moving. That's life. Yeah. So for a few of the very close friends, the bride and groom, 